let's jump right in here. So um, I added some agenda items. If you have other topics you want to discuss, uh, feel free to add them in here. Um, first, I just want to quickly catch everyone over um, the issues with uh, Neon Testnet that came up over the weekend. So we had ongoing sort of issues with our logging infrastructure uh, starting Friday evening. Um, and that ended up forcing a chain reset on Saturday uh, just afternoon. Um, since then, block production seems stable and, and higher than what we had before. Um, and this includes um, uh, the PR Ludo had. Uh, but I think we, we still have an issue where the expected chain height you know, should be much larger than what the sidecar is currently reporting. Um, and I think there was some discussion earlier this morning as well. So, so we have these two issues. One is we have a lot of failed Coinbase transactions um, on the sidecar. That might be because of a version mismatch. Um, I think we're still running an older version of the sidecar that uh, doesn't have like the, uh, doesn't incorporate the breaking change we made to the TX status field. So, uh, so we'll see that that might be just an issue that I, I don't know for sure if the Coinbase transactions are actually failing or if it's just a misreporting um, issue from the sidecar. So we'll find that soon. Um, I think Matt and Jivali are just upgrading the sidecar as we speak. Uh, the other issue, which I, I think we do need to kind of investigate is that the sidecar followers seems to be only seeing blocks from one miner, the neon miner, not other miners. Um, and is there anything else in terms of like known issues that happened over the weekend that we should add in here? Um, I think uh, what I would add is it's not clear that the the neon miner, like the master node, is seeing those blocks either. Like oh, the, the master node has like a current stacks block height of like 2000, um, but there have been like 6000 burn blocks. I see. So that wouldn't be speci specific to the miner, then it presumably all miners are missing have blocks. The same behavior. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Jude, I don't know if you've had uh, a chance to look into any of this. Any any thoughts or insights into what might be going on? Um, my focus for the past several days has been trying to address something else. Um, okay. Part of the uh, issue we saw with uh, logging back pressure, um, now that we've uh, separated out uh, debug logging from info and higher logging, has exposed why the system was emitting so many logging messages in the first place. Um, and it's actually the peer network doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, it turns out that when the system doesn't have any uh, neighbors to connect to, it enters a spin loop and will continue spinning in bursts that led to the intermittent uh, slowdown of the node that we saw on our end. Um, one thing led to another in trying to diagnose this and happy to talk about it more in the triage, but suffice to say, I'm, I'm hoping to have a pull request open for this by the end of the day. Um, it's currently okay. being addressed in my draft PR. Okay. Um, all right, so, so with that, maybe we can just jump into reviewing the board. Um, so we should probably file, open a new issue for, for this one, right? Uh, unless we have something that's already tracking it. Um, there's already issues open. No, I, I meant for, for this issue with the miners not seeing blocks from other miners, right? Or follower no, it's not receiving blocks from all the miners. I don't think we have an issue open for this yet. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll file a new one. Okay, let's uh, review the board. So one thing that I was noticing is that, um, at least in terms of the issues that are on the board right now, um, we haven't made a ton of progress on these issues over this past sprint. So um, it'll be good to just get a quick summary from folks on, you know, I think Jude just talked about like things he's spending time on. And I think there are some issues open for that. Maybe they're not tagged against this milestone. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're actually capturing, you know, where we're spending time on in issues and just so that it's, it's visible to everyone what's going on. And then it makes it easier for us to kind of push and plan for um, the, the next sprint. Um, so, so yeah, let's just go down Actually, yeah, maybe if, if people can just quickly talk through 
what they've been spending time on this past week and whether there are issues open for, for those tasks that maybe don't show up here. So I think we just heard from Jude. Uh, let's hear from uh, Aaron and Ludo next. Yeah, um, so uh, the past week while not working on some, there was like a handful of uh, clarity related uh, issues. Um, and I think there was that like uh, event logging issue. So like when not working on those like sort of smaller tasks, um, I've been trying to make progress on um, the proof of transfer sort of fork identifier um, uh, mechanism. I'm, I think that there's an issue for it, but I don't believe that it's in this milestone. Okay. What about you, Ludo? Um, so last week, <clears throat> so I think I spent some time on um, pushing a few commits on the mock net panics on second run, uh, 1576. Mm -hmm. Then there was an issue with the traits, uh, which have been solved. Um, uh, and yeah, I think there was a few investigations, uh, like the one on Friday and probably uh, some others. <clears throat> and I think, I, yeah, and I also spent some time uh, testing the new Kubernetes setup with, Ch with Charlie. Uh, okay. So yeah, it's back and forth and yeah. All right. Um, okay, so let's uh, just go through the board real quick here. So 1576 is, I think we had said that we will expand this to just support a graceful stop and start of um, Neon as well, right? Not just MockNet. Uh, so I actually, I would prefer if we first have a stable MockNet and then uh, uh, pursue with uh, with another issue for Neon because I think Neon is a different beast. Okay. So uh, what's the status here? Are you waiting on feedback? Uh, no, sort of I, I, I think I have a, a few less push to, to, I have some commit to push and yeah, I'd be asking for feedbacks. Okay. Um, okay. And just to be clear, the work that you're doing for supporting this on MockNet, like, do you think like some of it will be reusable or will help us? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Then I think that makes sense. Uh, 1582. This is mostly just refactoring, right, Aaron? Um, yes, this is mostly refactoring. Um, there was like one uh, bug that I think the refactoring surfaced. Um, but yeah. It's just a big refactor that um, the fork identifier stuff uh, depends on. So you're just waiting on feedback on this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, this today's the last day of this specific sprint. So whatever is outstanding on the board, I'm going to move it to the, the next milestone. Uh, let's talk about these four items here, Jude. I mean, like, they're all stalled, right? Like, yeah, because we're in the middle of fixing higher priority things that are causing neon to misbehave. Yeah, I'm just gonna move them to the next milestone. All right, um, these are all all still in the backlog. We haven't started work on any of these, right? Yeah, let's just talk about a, a few of these, um, you know, both to um, actually set some assignees um, and then maybe talk through prioritization. So 1547 um, has, has come up quite a few times, at least from the DevX team's perspective, like for Explorer, um, this seems like a pretty important uh, feature. Do we have a sense of like how much work this is to support? Um, and if anyone, has cycles to take this on, uh, not in this, but obviously, but the next one. Um, 
I don't think there would be a huge amount of work. Um, okay. It's, yeah, it's something I, I could probably take on fairly quickly. Um, All right. Yeah. Let's just do it then because I think it, it unblocks an important use case for them. Yeah. And then uh, I will move it to the next milestone. Okay. Um, what about 1463? And we talked about, you know, this is an issue on the sort of error path. Is this something that we are hitting? Um, how important is it to, to fix? Because I, I do think that there is a bunch of like other kind of more pressing issues. Um, so how do we want to prioritize this? It doesn't seem like anyone has actually hit this issue or complained about it, like in practice so far. Not to say that we, we shouldn't address this, but any any harm in uh, pushing it out, uh, maybe to the next sprint. Um, yeah, no, there's I would say no harm in pushing it out to the next sprint. Um, Um, all right, let's uh, go through these real quick. Um, is this one somewhat in progress or, or you haven't started work on this, Aaron? Um, haven't, haven't worked on this. So yeah, my, um, yeah, my, my priority stack has roughly been like either there's like a burning issue or I'm trying to make some progress on the, um, proof of transfer stuff. Yeah, is this a blocker or a dependency for the proof of transfer work or this is a completely orthogonal? No, it's it's orthogonal. They'll like cut, touch similar parts of the code base, but yeah. it's pretty orthogonal. Yeah. Okay, in that case, I'm just gonna move it out to some future milestone. It doesn't seem super urgent to address unless someone disagrees. Um, what about this one, Ludo, is still in the backlog? Yes. Okay. Um, 1504. Have you started any work on this at all? Uh, I started thinking about this and I, I think I wrote a few lines of code, but like, there's nothing concrete at this point. I've been prioritizing uh, issues and neon yeah. stability. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I think we have a sync with the DevX team tomorrow or the day after, um, and it'll be good to just get their thoughts on prioritizing you know, 1504 versus 1567. I think it was um, that we just, um, there was a, a transaction updates for, or pushing sort of mempool transaction updates out on the event stream. So if, if there is some prioritization between those two, we can get some feedback from them. Uh, 1557, I think we talked about this last time as well, Jude. I think it's something that we want to do, but it's not pressing or immediately blocking anything. That's correct. It can be right, made. I'm, okay, I'm just gonna push it out a little bit further. Okay, and then, um, all right. Let me just move both of these as well. Um, I think a bunch of these are in progress, right, Jude? Yeah, and that's the issue I'm currently working on. What about 1617? Is that? I mean, it seems like uh, um, that's part of the that's also in progress It's part of the minor stuff. Okay. So is this part of the same PR? Um, that's part of the uh, uh, minor. Sorry, the, the mining PR. Um, 
it's necessary in order for the miner to work correctly, as well as for uh, clients to see the materialized view of unapplied microblocks. Okay. Um, and just from sort of an end user perspective, like this, I mean, we, the minor stuff that you're working on, you know, will probably be useful a little bit closer to mainnet in terms of, um, again, just prioritization, this versus, you know, some of the more pressing things. Um, no, this is pretty high priority because we need yeah. to be testing microblock propagation uh, you know, as soon as possible, possibly like before POX even goes live. All right. And then uh, you said that you'll have a PR uh, out by end of day for 1635 through 46. And yeah. And 1617 uh, is just in a separate PR. That's correct. Okay. Um, so the 1617, maybe I should just move it to the next print. It doesn't seem like we'll have a PR for that today anyways, right? Oh yeah, that's correct. All right, let's go through new stuff that came in. Um, okay, so this is, do we feel like we have sufficiently resolved this for now? Or is there is there still an issue like, I think the... Well, some good news on this. Uh, I was just quickly looking at the uh, SQL databases of the production node and the node knows about almost as many sortitions as there are burn chain blocks. Okay. Um, the problem is that I think we think the problem is that miners who are uh, running behind a NAT. So people at home um, aren't sending the blocks to the master node and thus they're not propagating. Okay. So once that's addressed and that's a pretty easy fix, uh, the, we, we should still we, we should see the number of blocks in the chain to be approximately equal to the number of burn chain blocks like we want. Okay. So can I close this issue out? I mean, it seems like you know the the part of it that we could address with the sleep fix is already done, and then the minor issue is a separate one that we'll. And is that something that Jude you're working on or will work on? Uh, we haven't triaged it yet. I I just discovered this five minutes ago, so it's not even an issue for it. Okay. And it sounds like it's the same issue that we were just talking about, right? Uh, at the top of the meeting. It's, 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 it's um, not quite like the, the real issue here is that the, uh, when a node mines a block, it needs to push the block data itself. It can't just advertise the blocks availability. Um, it has uh, nothing to do with how fast or slow we mine the block. Should a, um, should a node that's operating behind a NAT always be pushing block data? It should. Um, uh, like regardless of whether or not it uh, is a minor. The, uh, oh, no, no, not necessarily. The only way that, the only reason a NATed node would have to push block data would be if it had block data that nobody else public, who's publicly routable has. I see. Which would only happen if the NATed node is a minor. Yeah. Um, this is also something I'm working on in the mining, uh, the mining PR, and that's to have a uh, the mining client send the block to the uh, node via an RPC interface, so the node itself will send the block along as well. Um, insofar as like making the distinction between native nodes and non-native nodes, that's also something I'm working on as well as part of the uh, um, the P2P PR that I'm going to have by end of day. Um, because in order for that to work correctly, the node does need to know whether or not it has a public IP address. So the node will have a way to determine this, to determine if it's natted as well. Okay, so just to summarize, um, the issue that Judy just mentioned, I mean, it, it doesn't exist as an issue yet, right? Right, we just discovered it now. Okay, and are you going to fold that into the the PR that you have for the P two P issues, or is that going to be a separate PR? It'll probably be a separate PR since it's unrelated. Okay. Um, yeah, in terms of like relative prioritization, what are people thinking? I mean, it seems like actually, I'm not sure. Um, 
well, this can be fixed in parallel. Um, like I don't necessarily okay. have to be the one to do it, but I'm happy to take it and just do it before anything else. Cause I think it's probably higher priority than the uh, P2P stuff I'm working on. Okay. Yeah. So if you can just file an issue for that, uh, that'll be great. Sure. Um, okay. So this PR is already in review or it's, oh, you marked it as draft. Yeah. Okay. So this is the PR that you'll pull out of draft basically. Yeah. Once it's been okay. tested. Okay. Um, this, I have a separate VM I'm using for testing this. I just need to actually test it on a publicly available VM first. Okay. This to get it in progress then. Um, okay, I think, um, Jude, you filed several issues over the last couple of days. Let's just talk through them. I think some of these came out of the discussion on Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so per the, per the discussion, uh, the, uh, the, qu the question was, do we want to allow a more general way um, for front end clients to call clarity functions? Uh, right now we're limiting ourselves to just read only functions, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can also be um, public functions or even private functions or even bare clarity code. Um, it's just that any mutations won't be materialized in the chain state. And the consensus we got from that meeting was that, yeah, we probably should do this. Um, okay. And are, is there stuff that we've seen like coming in um, on either discord or issues that folks have filed? Like, is this, would this enable like new use cases that people are not able to do right now? Like, I'm just trying to figure out like how quickly do, do, does this need to happen? It doesn't have to happen right this second. I don't think I have the, uh, it's more of a, the, the question is more like, um, what if you deploy your contract, like let's say on mainnet, and then later discover that, oh, you needed to expose some functions in your Clarity function, or you have a newer version of your app that needs to get at more state from your Clarity smart contract. Like you shouldn't be uh, using define read only as kind of like a suicide pact to make sure that you don't call certain functions and there's no real reason to constrain yourself that way. Mm. Okay. Um, all right, 1640. Okay, so this was a, um, this is already addressed in master as part of the fix for the bug that Friedger discovered. Um, right now, our transaction uh, polling logic that selects transactions from the mempool to build blocks, um, it in the past had been prioritizing everything by fee, nonce order notwithstanding. Um, that led to the situation where you could send let's say two transactions, one after the other um, with a dip with, you know, consecutive nonces, um, but the later one being mined before the earlier one, if it had a higher fee, thereby causing your transactions to span multiple blocks. Uh, the PR sent in 1634, which is addressing this issue, changed that so that transactions are mined in nonce order. So your two transactions would appear in the same block, um, but that's not completely correct either. What we need to do is prioritize both fees and nonce order so that miners get the um, best payoff from the blocks they produce, but also that people like users still have uh, somewhat good liveness when the system is running. Um, as mentioned down there, the optimal solution doesn't appear to be tractable because it's it looks like it's an NP hard problem, um, both in terms of how do you pack the block like the like in a knapsack type manner, um, as well as trying to find uh, sets of dependent transactions that don't conflict and that's tantamount to the uh, maximal subset problem. Um, so we'll need to think of a good heuristic or a good approximation algorithm for this. It's not um, something we need to do this sprint, but it is something we should, uh, it doesn't even have to be done by mainnet per se, but it should be something that we should be thinking about. It needs more research. All right, anyone else have any immediate thoughts on this? What about this one, Ludo? Um, so I did open this issue, and the idea is to improve. <clears throat> the idea is to improve the, the developer experience uh, for the clarity smart contract developers. 
simply by improving the uh, wording of the errors raised by the VM. Uh, so yeah, that's like, I, I've been looking at the Discord channel and like, it, it looks like there's a, a lot of errors that are not easily understandable. So that could be a quick win that uh, John can take on. Uh, so I did talk with John about that, uh, but I, I don't really know about the priority there. So I, I'm, John is the, the main assignee. I, I can provide some support, but uh, I won't be okay. spending some time on that. But is he actively working on this? I, I, I don't think that he does at this point, but uh, he's aware of that. Okay, let me just... Uh, okay. All right. Oh, this is also something that came up um, in the meeting on Wednesday, right? Right. It's like the discussion around macros. Um, so, and you want to quickly summarize what's suggested here? Um, I don't think we've reached a consensus yet on what the best approach forward is, but the problem is that uh, define constant is kind of ambiguous and surprising into what it does uh, because it will either take um, something that can be evaluated at analysis time, it can, but it can also take something that will be evaluated at runtime. Uh, for example, you could put a uh, define constant for some constant name and bind it to the evaluation of a function that loads state from a, another clarity contract, for example. Uh, the reason why that's a problem for us is that it leads to the surprising result where you can't do the following construct there. You can't define a contract address as a constant and then feed it into contract call. Um, because contract adder might not even be known at analysis time. Um, so what, what we need to do is find a way to um, differentiate between constants that are known at analysis time and constants that are, aren't only known at runtime um, in order uh, to be able to use constants like people would expect, i.e. like with contract call. Um, that How to do this though is still not entirely clear. Uh, we could either overload define constants so it just does the right thing, but then it's surprising when some constants work and some don't. Uh, we could create a different top level like to, dis to distinguish between a uh, runtime constant or a static constant, um, but that's also problematic as it increases developer overhead. There's now two more top level definitions to contend with. Uh, third option is to create a primitive macro system um, that can take inlineable expressions that would be usable um, at analysis time. Um, disadvantage there is that it's going to be a different macro system from what are from most conventional Lisp macro systems. Um, it won't be nearly as featureful, for example, and that could also be a point of confusion. All right. So is the next step here to try and collect, get some more feedback from the community because I think this originally came from people. Um, uh, wanting to avoid like, you know, writing the same address uh, over and over again, like as they're calling into contracts, um, yes. which, yes, I mean, like it's a nice syntactic sugar, but doesn't seem like a, a, a terrible trade off. Like if it keeps things cleaner, at least for now, while we figure out uh, how best to address this. So is there an except to just like collect some more feedback from folks on this? I suppose uh, it's probably, go ahead. Uh, so I think that, um, one useful thing would maybe be to um, just kind of uh, spec out what the macro case would look like um, in practice, uh, just so that people have like, I guess, something to look at and evaluate of like whether or not it makes sense or is confusing. Okay. All right. Um it seems like we're we're okay punting this for now uh, until we yeah. have some more data. All right. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this next one. It's it's in my plate um, to do. Uh, we've had a a bunch of kind of back and forth um, on on this one. Uh, 
has has anything changed or our end? I think we've or do more people want to chime in on this issue? Um, I think that this is like a fairly low priority nicety. Okay. Um, like right. it could be, it could be nice to have. Um, it may be more confusing than it is nice to have. Um, but in any event, I, I would say it's it's fairly low priority. Um, All right. Uh, operations that like may be nicer to have variatics for sooner rather than later is like another issue he created around like variatic looping functions like map and filter mm -hmm. so that you could uh, map or filter over two lists simultaneously. Um, but, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like skipping over some of these issues that we've already talked about. Um, I thought, wasn't 1622 addressed already? Um, oh, yes. So this, I think, is addressed uh, on the blockchain side, but it might not be addressed on the transactions JS side. Okay. Um, so the stacks node will handle escaped question marks correctly. Um, yeah. But okay. Stacks Transaction JS needs to generate the escaped URLs. Let me just um, add a comment here. All right. Is this the one that Ludo you were looking at before? Or have you looked at this before? I don't recall going through this. Uh, it's not this one. But have you looked at this? Like, is this an actual bug? No, I, I, I look into it. All right. I wonder if it's related or not. All right. Um, okay, I think we went through all of these other ones before. Okay, so unless uh, there is any other issue here that folks want to discuss, I want to get back to our agenda. Um, something that I think Friedgar brought up on Discord, um, it's a new tag for uh, Clarity JS SDK. I actually don't know exactly what these things mean. New tag on Stacks blockchain for Clarity SDK. Maybe Ludo, you can shed some light on this. Like what is the current release process for uh, Clarity JS SDK and, and what dependency does it have on Stacks blockchain? Uh, I'm actually not sure. I think Matt did the setup there. Okay. Uh, um, so maybe I can just tag Matt. Yeah. All right, I will follow up with Matt. Um, I think that covers most of the stuff that I, I had put on the agenda. Anything else um, that we're missing that we should add or any other topics people had in mind? Um, you don't have a, a ton of community members today. Dan, anything that you want to ask about or talk about? No, thank you. All right, well, if there's nothing else, uh, we can end early today. Um, cool, I, I think uh, I'll just mention this as an FYI. Um, I'm working with uh, Jude, I'm also getting feedback from an input from um, Jesse Soslow to, to figure out you know, what 
changes do we want to make um, uh, in terms of the Stacks blockchain as Jude um, transitions uh, to the foundation? Uh, part of that will be uh, a copyright assignment for all of the, you know, all of the source code. Um, that's likely going to happen a little bit later. There is some other um, uh, legal issues that need to be sorted through um, in terms of the timeline. Um, the other thing that we are contemplating and debating is whether the stocks, stacks blockchain repository itself, um, you know, should uh, at some point live under a stacks organization on GitHub or a stacks foundation organization on GitHub. Um, so uh, that one, we there are some um, logistics I need to figure out there whether GitHub supports uh, transparent redirects when you move repositories across organizations. Like basically just figuring out how disruptive something like this might be um, in practice. So I'm going to do uh, a dry run with like a dummy repository, and Jude, I'll follow up you follow up with you offline um, on on doing that testing. Um, and then again, the timeline on that is roughly end of June. Um, so so I'll keep uh, everyone posted here. Um, any kind of movement to stacks. I mean, we renamed it recently, um, but that's a uh, less drastic move than moving the repository across organizations. So, so I want to have at least some scope of the blast radius there before we make that change. Uh, so I'll spend some time digging around to see what that might look like um, before we make any changes, but just wanted to give people a heads up that that might come. All right, that's all. Thanks everyone.